Welcome to Florida's Cannabis News Podcast, a weekly podcast exploring the legal, political, and economic changes to Florida's cannabis industry, covering important news and events for Florida cannabis businesses and professionals. Sit back and relax. Florida's Cannabis News Podcast begins now. Hello and welcome. Today is Friday, May 10th, 2019, and you're tuned into Florida's Cannabis News Podcast. This is your host, David, and you can find me here every Friday covering the latest news and events in Florida's cannabis industry. This week, the Florida cannabis industry brings us another news-filled episode, so let's dive right into this week's top stories. This week's top story comes out of the Orlando Sentinel, where Derek Cam is reporting that two medical cannabis operators, MMTCs, have filed administrative complaints seeking more storefront locations. These complaints come after one MMTC, True Leave, recently settled with the state of Florida to lift the number of retail locations they are allowed to open. So, going back in time, when Rick Scott rolled out our medical cannabis program under Amendment 2 in 2017, he imposed a cap of 25 dispensaries each operator was allowed to open. So, if you held an MMTC license, you can open 25 retail locations to sell your products. Now, this doesn't take into consideration local ordinances, so the opportunities are limited in terms of zoning and land use. But nonetheless, they still have the opportunity to open 25 locations. This number has gradually increased as the number of qualified patients have increased. So when we hit 200,000 patients, each MMTC gained five more retail dispensary locations as the 2017 law dictates. But there's nothing in the Florida Constitution that creates such a limit on the number of retail locations an MMTC can open. This retail location cap was implemented through the Florida Legislature in 2017, among many other requirements like limiting the total number of MMTC licenses themselves the state can issue, in addition to mandating vertical integration. Many lawsuits have come up as a result of this law, but TrueLeave filed a complaint in 2018 saying that the cap on dispensary retail locations was arbitrary and unconstitutional. If you want an in-depth breakdown of TrueLeave's successful lawsuit that led to these two new dispensaries that we're talking about today filing administrative complaints, go ahead back to April 5th episode to get a full breakdown on the TrueLeave legal battle that brings us to this story today. But just for some cliff notes, uh, True Leave and their lawsuit asked the court to keep their current dispensary locations that have already been approved and applied for, and they asked the court to be allowed to open 25 more dispensary locations under its MMTC license. True Leave's lawsuit ended up going all the way to the appellate court, and back in April, state health officials dropped their appeal of the lower court ruling, which was in favor of True Leave, thus agreeing to allow True Leave to open more dispensaries than the statutory cap imposed. The settlement agreement was signed by True Leave CEO Kim Rivers and Courtney Coppola, who's the director of the Office of Medical Marijuana Use, back in April. And under the agreement, True Leave is allowed to open a total of 49 dispensaries, its original 14 dispensaries it had opened, plus the temporary cap of 35 included in the 2017 law. This is before the cap will be eliminated in 2020. True Leave won their court battle. They got their extra dispensaries. But now this week, two other MMTCs, Sutera and Cureleaf, are now seeking the same treatment as True Leave got. So, both operators filed administrative complaints accusing health officials of creating an invalid rule with their settlement with True Leave, and they're also asking to lift the dispensary cap for them as well, because the True Leave settlement only allowed True Leaves themselves to open more than the state imposed cap of 35 retail locations. True Leaf settlement did not apply to every MMTC in the state. Now MMTCs are reacting to the settlement and want equal treatment. Lawyers for Sutera and Cureleaf are arguing that allowing the settlement to only apply to True Leaf and not to the other MMTCs in the state of Florida, lawmakers are restricting access to medicine and granting True Leaf an improper competitive advantage. So to put this into perspective, these three companies are part of the original Big Five who were granted licenses in November of 2015 under the low THC laws Florida had. This was our first medical cannabis program, and those five being Sutera, Cureleaf, True Leave, Liberty, and Knox Medical, who is now rebranded under the name Fluent Cannabis. 
But nowadays, we have smaller MMTCs through Governor DeSantis issuing more licenses. So we're starting to see, or really have already saw, the range of MMTCs you're going to be able to find in the state of Florida. You can find MMTCs that have sold only one gram of cannabis. You can find MMTCs that don't even have a single retail location open. And you could also find other mammoths like Cureleaf, who recently struck a deal with CVS, the largest drugstore chain by total sales in the United States, to carry Cureleaf hemp lotions and transdermal patches. The deal between Cureleaf and CVS will put Cureleaf products in about 800 stores across the United States. Cureleaf has a license in Florida, but they have expanded to become a multi-state operator. Not only a multi-state operator, but Cureleaf is the most valuable United States cannabis company. Just recently, last month, they acquired Cura Partners, a maker of oil for vape pens, in a stock deal valued at about $950 million. That makes it the largest acquisition so far between U.S. cannabis companies. So it's just interesting to see the bigger players battle it out in our state. It's really the bigger players who move the needle. True Leaf has been making waves in the news. They got their settlement agreement. Now Cura Leaf and Sutera, who's also another big cannabis operator, trying to get their piece of the cake. But this isn't the first time the Florida cannabis program has been called unfair. Remember all of those MMTC applicants sued to get their licenses? DeSantis ended up issuing a bunch of those last month, and we have the Florida-grown lawsuit still going on as well. Issues in the Florida cannabis space tend to get resolved through litigation, so I'm excited to see what ends up happening here. The administrative judge consolidated both Sutera's and Cureleaf's complaints and set a hearing date for May 28th. We will definitely follow this story up as it continues to develop. So will these two complaints lead more MMTCs to follow suit? Do you think allowing only True Leaf to operate more dispensaries than the statutory imposed cap of 35 is unfair? The other MMTCs do have to wait to open new locations when the statute says they can. Every time we gain 100,000 patients. Let me know on Twitter what you think, underscore FL Cannabis News. I'd love to continue the conversation there and see, see what other people in the community think. You could find more quotes from this story in Derek Cam's article in the Orlando Sentinel, linked below in the show notes. This week's second top story comes out of Orlando, where a great-grandmother was arrested at Disney World for having CBD oil in her purse as she was checking in through security. She apparently had a doctor's note with her, but I'm not sure if she actually had a medical cannabis recommendation, and I'm also unsure where she bought the CBD oil from. Did she buy it from a licensed MMTC? Or did she buy it from a gray market dealer like a vitamin shop or a gas station? Nonetheless, after discovering the CBD oil in her purse, Orange County police officers arrested her. This is an interesting story because of all the hype CBD oil has garnered in 2019. So CBD's full name is cannabidiol. It's a non-psychoactive cannabinoid found in the cannabis plant. CBD commonly helps people with arthritis, which in this case is what the grandmother was using it for, and other chronic pain, anxiety, inflammation, depression, and many other conditions. There are roughly 113 cannabinoids in the cannabis plant, but the two most popular ones in today's industry are THC and CBD. THC is the intoxicating cannabinoid, and CBD is the non-psychoactive cannabinoid, but still very effective medically. Now, cannabinoids are simply just the chemical compounds that are in the cannabis plant. And we as humans have an endocannabinoid system, which when we intake cannabis, our endocannabinoid system takes in all of those cannabinoids. So the CBD market kind of exploded when the 2018 federal farm bill passed in December of last year, which removed hemp from the CSA, Controlled Substances Act. Now, hemp is all parts of the cannabis plant that have less than 0.3% THC. This bill opened the door for creating cannabis products that have less than 0.3% THC, but have X amount of CBD depending on the product. This paved the way for producers of hemp-derived CBD products to come to market. So just to compare, the cannabis that Florida MMTC sell contains anywhere from 5 to 20% THC, whereas hemp products, still coming from the same species of cannabis plant, does not even have 1% THC. So when you produce hemp-derived CBD products, you're getting all the deliciousness of CBD with no psychoactive THC effects. 
and that's what has made CBD so popular in recent years. Citizens are willing to try the CBD products before trying products with THC in it. CBD has assimilated into United States culture much faster than THC has. Now you can find CBD in restaurants, you can find it online on Amazon, and other mainstream distributors. So the 2018 Farm Bill shifted the regulation of hemp, again, hemp is all parts of the cannabis plant that contain less than 0.3% THC. Why they chose that number, I'm not sure, but anything under 1% will have a very insignificant effect in getting you intoxicated. So the Farm Bill shifted the regulation of hemp and hemp-derived products out of drug law land, the Controlled Substances Act, and also under the purview of the DEA, and into agricultural laws and under the purview of the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. So now hemp is treated as an agricultural product, whereas before it was treated as a controlled substance. Now it's just treated like any other staple crop, like corn and soybeans. But we have not been able to grow hemp for decades. We're behind every industrialized country in regards to this agricultural commodity. Legally speaking, the federal government, through the Farm Bill, gave authority to states to adopt their own plan to grow and sell hemp-derived products. So, states can implement laws that are stricter than the federal Farm Bill, but if the state does not implement their own hemp program, they were going to have to be regulated under the federal hemp program. Now, the federal hemp program is still in the process of developing regulations, but it's expected that final rules will be implemented by the end of the calendar year 2019. So the federal farm bill also allowed hemp producers to participate in interstate commerce contingent upon both states that are doing the interstate commerce in this scenario are producing hemp under the state program or the hemp or the federal program. It's interesting because the Farm Bill is going to permit interstate commerce, but cannabis operators like True Leaf and Cure Leaf cannot move their products out of state, they're st but they're still engaging in interstate commerce. Cannabis, anything above 0.3% THC, will not be allowed and is not allowed to be transported in interstate commerce because it's still federally illegal substance. But when Cure Leaf opens in other states, so for example, what makes Cure Leaf a multi state operator is that they have a Florida license, but they've also obtained Massachusetts licenses and things like that. That's still operating in interstate commerce. The United States Supreme Court case, Gonzalez v. Reich, said that one lady growing a plant in her backyard was interstate commerce. That's how broad the Supreme Court has defined interstate commerce. They explain that local use of her growing her one plant in her home affected supply and demand in the national cannabis market, making the regulation of intrastate use essential to regulating the drug's national market. So Congress can regulate cannabis under this Controlled Substances Act. Congress has this power through Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which is, a sen which is the Commerce Clause, and... Congress has this power to create national free trade zones, not to allow the federal government to create massive market inefficiencies, or even prohibit interstate commerce in some scenarios, which Congress has done here. But Congress has still not issued any federal regulations according for cannabis. Congress's inability to deal with cannabis in a serious manner has put the United States market well behind competitors like Israel and Canada both of whom have fully legalized cannabis, but most importantly, don't allow trade barriers between jurisdictions in their countries. In late February of this year, Senator Cory Booker, Democrat out of New Jersey, reintroduced the Marijuana Justice Act, which would legalize cannabis as a matter of federal law. But operators are still willing to step into this federally illegal space and operate under state cannabis laws because of guidance from the Cole Memo, which was issued by the Department of Justice, which says that the Department of Justice will not use federal resources to go after cannabis companies that operate under state cannabis laws. Even though MMTCs like Cure Leaf, True Leaf, Liberty, all of the Florida MMTCs, even though they're selling federally illegal substance, they're willing to operate under Florida law because of guidance from the Department of Justice that, hey, we're not going to mess with you if you comply with your state's cannabis laws. Now, this is different from operators who want to sell CBD even without a license from the state because of the, floor, because of the federal farm bill. And law enforcement is still seizing hemp from these producers. 
So back in January, a semi-truck in Oklahoma carrying over 18,000 pounds of hemp was stopped. Suspected of it being marijuana, the drivers were arrested, and officers said when they walked up to the 18-wheeler, they could smell the cannabis emitting from the inside of the truck. Which isn't surprising because it's still the same plant material as cannabis that most people, you know, um, think smells, and it just doesn't have as much THC. But several samples were tested, and several of the samples that were tested registered at 0.4% THC. And as you know, the legal threshold to classify the plant as hemp is 0.3%. The drivers were eventually released, but this just shows that officials still want to take a deep dive into someone who might be transporting hemp. And the tests came after the hemp was impounded. Maybe the hemp wasn't stored right. Maybe it went bad. Or as the CBD bales age, there's potentially a conversion that could increase the amount of THC. And officials are still willing to pull you over and seize your product. But anyways, back to this week. At Disney World, an Orange County deputy found CBD oil in Great Grandma's purse and subsequently arrested her. She ended up spending 12 hours behind bars and then was released on a $2,000 bond. Her name is Hester, and she began using CBD oil for her arthritis. I'm not sure, again, if she obtained it from an MMTC, but I'm pretty sure she didn't because I don't think the story would have ended this way if she would have just had her medical card on her, shown them the products from the MMTC. But this comes at a very interesting time because last week, the Florida legislator passed Senate Bill 1020, which creates our our state hemp program under the Florida Department of Agriculture. Us creating Senate Bill 1020 is Florida exercising its right under the federal farm bill to implement our hemp program. We had a full discussion on Senate Bill 1020 on last week's show, so be sure to head over there if you want a full breakdown. Once Governor DeSantis signs the hemp bill, the hemp bill will take effect on July 1st, 2019. Now, despite the fact that CBD is still sold in stores on shelves across our state that aren't by MMTCs, I'm talking vitamin shops, gas stations, this CBD oil is still technically illegal in the state of Florida if you're not selling as a medical marijuana treatment center. But once July 1st hits, CBD will no longer be considered an illegal controlled substance under Florida law. Now, this doesn't mean that those CBD distributors, these gray market sellers, are 100% in the clear. The FDA is still in the background regulating CBD that is sold for human consumption. Even though CBD might be legal as a hemp-derived product, the FDA has not issued regulations that allows producers and distributors to sell CBD as a dietary supplement. And the FDA isn't messing around. They've cracked down on gray market CBD retailers. So if you choose to sell CBD outside of being a medical marijuana treatment center in Florida, you're still exposing yourself to potential liability because the FDA is still there in the background. But under Florida law, these sellers will probably get some relief come July 1st. Unlike our current cannabis program, the Florida Hemp Bill does not have a cap on the number of licenses that can be issued to produce hemp. Now, just an example of the FDA crackdowns, in April, the FDA sent warning letters to three companies, one being in Florida, Pot Network Holdings, saying that um, these companies were making unsubstantiated claims relating to more than a dozen different products and spanning over multiple product web pages, online stores, and social media websites. The main thing the FDA is trying to prevent the CBD producers from doing is making health claims and then selling it at stores and telling people it's going to fix X, Y, and Z problem. Those are who the FDA is really going to target. But again, we're talking retail sales. We're talking head shops, selling bars of soaps, tinctures, topicals, things of that nature. Now, whether CBD is permitted as a food additive, that's something the FDA needs to address. The FDA will hopefully address this in their highly anticipated public hearing on May 31st, just three weeks from now. Hopefully, the FDA speaks about CBD and issues potentially some more guidance on that May 31st meeting. We will for sure keep you guys updated with that as it relates directly to Florida law. So these operators that you might go see down the street that aren't an MMTC, they're still willing to sell CBD products. I mean, when you have CVS carrying Cureleaf CBD products, that to me is an informal sign that the gates have broken down and sends the message to smaller operators like, you know, your vitamin shops and your gas stations to try their hands in the market. These owners, these business owners are willing to take the risk that the FDA will not come after them. 
I mean, this is all happening in the FDA's face, and they haven't done anything about the CVS deal. So to me, that's, an, a, sim, that's a symbolic go-ahead. As states implement their hemp programs, we're going to see CBD market mature, and operators who are not licensed by the state under Florida cannabis laws maybe grab a hemp license and legally sell CBD in Florida with the FDA continuing to loom in the background. I think by the time all the dust settles, the FDA will have issued some rules about selling CBD for human consumption, and that way CBD is going to be good to go from top to bottom. The thing is, we just still don't have hemp rules on the books yet. Once we have hemp rules in, then it's going to be okay to sell under state law, and we're still going to have to wait until DeSantis signs the bill for the Florida Department of Agriculture to then promulgate rules for the program. Once the Department of Agriculture creates these rules, they're going to have to seek approval from the Federal Department of Agriculture, and this whole process might not be complete until the fall. So until then, selling CBD in Florida, not as an MMTC, you're still operating in the gray market. As long as Florida does not have a hemp program, CBD is not to be sold unless it's by an MMTC. But this isn't stopping people, as I mentioned before. There's restaurants that sell CBD, and they're just saying, it's, it's, it's fine, no one's going to come after me. But the FDA has cracked down. They have seed CBD products, and they have told operators to stop selling CBD products. Once Florida does have a hemp program, the FDA could maybe still not have cleared up their stance on selling CBD for human consumption. We're currently operating in murky waters, and we'll keep you in the loop with everything in Florida cannabis and how it connects with major movements at the federal level. Back to Hester at Disney World, though. The Orange County Sheriff's Office later reported that charges against her were eventually dropped. But she was arrested. You know, we're... we're Florida counties are using resources to arrest people, but then don't do anything about the gas stations, the health food stores that are selling CBD in the open. It doesn't make much sense. Even though these outlets still are not allowed to sell CBD, Florida collects sales tax on these products, and then they go and arrest elderly women who are not causing, a, not causing harm at all. Her vacation was ended up being ruined because of something so harmless. You can buy CBD in any county, but this is just another example of how unclear the CBD and cannabis space is to law enforcement. Tweet, tweet me or email me if I'm incorrect, but I don't think she bought the product from an MMTC, nor do I think she's a, red a, a registered medical cannabis patient. I think the ending would have turned out differently if she was able to pull out her medical cannabis card and say, listen, officer, I'm a patient. This is my medicine, but I'm really not sure. In Florida, you, you really don't know. There's room for argument either way. But this story shows that we need more education, not only on the law enforcement side, but on the consumer side as well. You take the risk of bringing your CBD products out of your house and taking them when, when you travel. It's just how the times are right now. And that's why I'm here every week covering this industry because consumers need to become knowledgeable about the industry and legalities of their products. Disney World is a higher risk area for something like this to happen because they have tight security. You know, they don't allow al alcohol, outside alcohol, onto their property. So just be aware of this stuff when you weigh the risks of traveling with cannabis or other hemp-derived products. But um, Michael Holland has great quotes and more background on this story on Fox News articles linked down below in the show notes. Our last top story of the week comes out of Tampa, where against parent wishes, a Hillsborough County judge ruled that three-year-old Noah McAdams must undergo chemotherapy as he continues to fight recent cancer diagnosis. His parents, Taylor Bland and Joshua McAdams, have asked the court to allow them to forego chemotherapy in favor of other alternative treatments, including medicinal cannabis. But the judge ruled on Wednesday that a three-year-old diagnosed with leukemia must continue chemotherapy treatment against the wishes of his parents. This ruling marks the latest twist in the case of Noah McAdams, who was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia back in April. After two rounds of chemo, his parents decided they wanted to try a more natural, holistic approach. Now, Noah has two more chemotherapy sessions as part of his first phase of his treatment, which is expected to resume Thursday, um, and he was originally prescribed three phases of chemo treatment, but the judge will decide whether Noah must continue with the next two phases after bone marrow testing is completed. This story has some interesting history because the parents had lost custody of Noah before. The parents did not bring Noah to the hospital for a scheduled treatment on April 22nd, and a hospital social worker notified Hillsborough Child Protective Services, which requested that police perform a welfare check on the family. 
Hillsboro Sheriff's County then issued a missing endangered child alert for Noah on April 29th, and the family was found in Kentucky that night, and Noah was flown back to Tampa the next day in custody of Child Protective Services. Noah's parents said they didn't know they weren't allowed to leave the state. They said they were staying with family in Kentucky and planning to visit a doctor in Cincinnati that week. The parents previously told doctors that they were seeking second opinions and to pursue alternative treatments for him. So that'll be interesting to see how this story progresses. The next court dates are set for June 4th and 5th, and we will keep you updated as this story moves forward. And as a reminder, we have all of our news we cover here on the podcast linked on our Twitter account, underscore FL Cannabis News. So follow us on Twitter to get these updates in real time and analysis during the week. And let's talk on Twitter. Let's 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 explore the issues. This week's weekly patient count from Florida's Office of Medical Marijuana Use brings us to 215,435 patients. As you know, the office releases their weekly update on Friday afternoons just after we publish our episodes, so I'm going to leave a link, as I usually do in the show notes, so you can go on over, click their weekly update page, and you can see the most updated numbers. Those are our top stories of the week. Let's move into upcoming events. This Thursday, May 16th, the South Florida Healthcare Executive Forum is hosting an awesome event at FAU from 5.30 p.m. to 8.15 p.m. Now, Florida Atlantic University is located in Davie, Florida at 3200 College Avenue. The event will be hosted in Student Room, Room 105. Now, this event is amazing. If you are in the healthcare industry, they're going to be talking about the possession and use of cannabis, a legal and ethical dilemma for healthcare organizations. It's going to be moderated by Charles Felix, who is the owner and publisher of Cannabis News Florida, South Florida Hospital News, Ashwin Mehta, who is a medical director, Stephen Seagull, who is also a lawyer, Michelle Weiner, who is a practitioner, CBD expert, and educator, and Don Moxley, a former director of applied sciences and brand development of a medical cannabis dispensary. Registration is required. Tickets will be $50. Um, It should be a great time. A lot of learning, and I will leave the ticket link below in the show notes. This week is a light week for cannabis events in Florida, but we have been talking about hemp a lot on today's episode, so I just wanted to get you early birds on the radar uh, with a hemp conference that's going on in Florida from November 3rd to the 5th. It's the inaugural Florida Industrial Hemp Conference and Exhibition at the Rosen Center in Orlando. Tickets will be $300, and that's competitively priced for a three-day program. I've seen cannabis events for a one-day program be $1,800. This will be an awesome event to get your feet wet in Florida's hemp industry. I hope to see you all there. I will post the tickets below in the show notes if any of you want to get ahead early and plan your November trips. That's it for Florida's top cannabis news and events. If you have any stories or events you'd like us to share, head on over to our Twitter account, underscore FL Cannabis News, or email us at floridacannabisnewspodcast at gmail.com. Add and rate us five stars and subscribe and share with your friends if you like the podcast. Thank you for staying up to date with Florida's cannabis industry. I'll be back with you again next Friday for another news-filled episode of Florida's Cannabis News Podcast. Have a great weekend, everybody. 